Today we're going to talk about the Beast Monarch and give a little bit more detail than the Monwood did. The Beast Monarch's personality was probably one of the most confident, the most arrogant, the most vicious uh, character in the series. And you could see that through his, his fights, you could see that through all of his uh, time on the, the panels, that he was a very aggressive and unrelenting character. And he's definitely had that beast in him that he would go ahead and just eat like living humans. Like he would just go ahead and eat them um, while he came out into the human world. The first time we saw him was in chapter 107. And that's when, uh, you know, Sang Jebu just finished up the Jeju Island raid. And we saw him with the Frost Monarch and they basically confirmed that the Shadow Monarch was on Earth and that they needed to find him if they wanted to continue their war with the rulers. Basically, that didn't really go well with them, so what they did is they went ahead, or the Beast Monarch went ahead and tried to kill Christopher Reed, which they did exceed in doing uh, with the other three monarchs that were on Earth at the time. They destroyed him in his own home. They tried to open the realms to let their armies, the monarch realms of, you know, the beast, um, the insects, and then the frost, uh, plane um, and it didn't work well for them because they tried to they almost killed uh, Sung Jin Woo They almost did what they did instead is that they opened or awakened the powers of Shadow Monarch inside of Sung Jin Woo So then after that they kind of got their asses whooped But the thing to realize is that the abilities that the Beast Monarch had were able to He was the only one that was able to actually pierce uh, Sung Jin Woo um, So some of the abilities that were gonna that the Beast Monarch had is that he had immense strength like I was saying that he was able to pierce a hole through Sung Jin Woo even though it didn't work out in the end, uh, he got brutally destroyed. He, he still had that immense strength that allowed him to, you know, pierce probably one of the strongest persons in the manhwa, basically. Um, and he also had immense durability because every time he fought against Sung Jiru, he would like, he would get sliced up, he would get destroyed, um, but he was able to regenerate, which is another power. He had, dur he had durability and regeneration. So it was one of the <laughs> very beneficial power to have during a fight with Sung Jun Woo, he could just literally destroy you. And then he also had immense speed because he was able to keep up with Thomas Andre, he was able to keep up with Sung Jin, Sung Jin Woo before he was awakened. So a, a good repertoire of speed. Um, you know, it's a little difficult to say how fast they were actually going in the manual, you know, in the later fights. Um, but you know, maybe they were going as fast as shadows, who knows? <laughs> Is that he was able to transform into a gigantic white werewolf um, you know, maybe that gave him, you know, a, you know, a Zenkai boost, you know, maybe that was multiply, he multiplied his power by 10 or like Kaio Kaioken or something. We don't really know because Sung Jin Woo just completely destroyed him in four hits. But we do know that it might have, you know, Mace basically gave him more power because the spiritual manifestation is supposed to, you know, basically be a power boost and you're able to use your power to your full extent in the human world, basically. So we do know that the spiritual manifestation allowed him to turn into a giant werewolf, but we don't really know how powerful that spiritual manifestation was. So um, let me know in the comments below if you guys know. Um, today we're going to explain Legia, the king of giants and the monarch of beginnings. All right, now let's get into it. And I know what you're thinking, no, 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 not those giants, but we're talking about giants from subtle leveling. Um, so Legia was the king of giants and his personality kind of stemmed like a scheming and conniving type of person. And he also had a very weird and strange sense of humor. He would just randomly start laughing when he was, when he was introduced to Sung Jin Woo and he was just randomly laughing about, you know, how another monarch found him. But the history of him is that he was a part of the war between the monarchs and the rulers, but he was caught by the rulers and he basically was chained up in his lair. They gave him mana absorbing chains so during his fight with Sung Jin Woo, he couldn't really use all of his skills. So it's kind of a disappointment that we don't know his full potential of what, what his skills he can use, but we do know a little bit. The Sung Jin Woo conversation during his, you know, dialogue with Sung Jin Woo, um, that he was trying to help Sung Jin Woo uh, help defeat the other monarchs and basically have peace on earth. But that wasn't really his plan. He just wanted Sung Jin Woo to release him. And then after the fight, he would go ahead and backstab Sung Jin Woo. Although Sung Jin Woo is a little smarter than the typical protagonist, so he, he was able to sense the bloodlust in Legia and basically beheaded him like with one, one strike. So that was basically the end of Legia, and that's where he really, he only really had like, I think three or four chapters. He wasn't really a big part of the story, but that's all we kind of really know about him. 
But let's talk about his abilities. His abilities, he had immense strength, as you would expect of a, uh, a monarch of giants or the king of giants. And then he also had he also had a really unique skill, which was truth indicament. So truth indicament basically allows the caster to not tell lies, and it also allows the caster who he's conversating with to not be able to tell lies. So that's what he used in this conversation with Sung Jun Woo, and he couldn't really lie, or they both had to think like they both were playing a chess match and to not really give their whole plan out but to not lie to each other so it was a really cool dialogue that they had between them and then his another power that he had was spiritual body manifestation but as we know he was in mana absorbing change and we never got to see it so let me know in the comments below what you guys think that uh his spiritual body manifestation was because nobody knows to this point we, we probably may never know but then he also had a huge army of giants and it was kind of theory crafted that the the, the big as a giant that sung jin Wu had to fight to get into the gate was basically a a manifestation of Legia with the mana he had left with his uh, mana absorbing chains on. And that's kind of crazy when you think about it because that's basically like, you know what, maybe like one eighth or one tenth of his power because he's been absorbed, his mana has been absorbed by these chains for I don't know how long. And he was able to create that huge giant in front of the, the S rank gate. So let, let that really sink in and we can try to extrapolate his power from that. Uh, but let me know in the comments below. Do you guys think he was a strong monarch? Do you guys think he would have been, he would have given Sung Jun Won a little bit run for his money if he didn't, if he wasn't chained up in mana absorbing chains? Uh, but let me know in the comments below and leave a like if you like. Today we're going to explain the monarch of insects more than the Monwa did. Okay, now let's get into it. So the monarch of insects name is Corisha. Corisha or the monarchs, if you guys don't know about solo leveling, monarchs are the, basically the evil bad guys of solo leveling. They are hell bent on trying to use earth and to be their, to be their next battleground in the ruler's war and the monarch war. So they want to basically destroy earth in the process so they can figure out who's stronger, the monarchs or the rulers. The personality of Carisha, she is a vicious and cunning, conniving, woman that really likes slaughtering her prey. Um, the monarchs are very primal in a sort of sense that they really like to, their opponents are prey to them. Carisha embodies that and then she also has a motherly side to her because she's the queen of insects so anytime she goes against a insect opponent she she kind of you know gets that motherly sense to her and wants to dominate them and try to get them to bend to her rule so we first see her in the story when sun jung woo the main character of solo leveling completes the s rank tokyo gate when legia the monarch of giants opened a s rank tokyo gate and when sun jung woo to finish that uh the frost monarch the queen of the queen of insects and the Beast Monarch kind of knew that Sun Jin Wu was about because they realized that you know his powers and his shadows were through the throughout the world. So they were like, eh, we need to do something about this guy. So first they went to go ahead and kill Christopher Reed because they didn't want any ruler reincarnations in the in Earth, the battleground that they want to prepare for the ruler war. So they went ahead and killed him. Uh, the Beast Monarch, the Frost Monarch, and the Carisha, they all went to his house, just destroyed him because it was three on one and he didn't stand a chance. They went ahead because the Beast Monarch was going throughout uh, Tokyo and trying to destroy all the people there and the Frost Monarch and Carisha went with him because they were trying to draw out Sung Jun Woo and lo and behold who comes to the site Sung Jun Woo so he gets into a entanglement with the Beast Monarch but then the Frost Monarch and Carisha try to basically ambush him but you can't ambush Sung Jun Woo because he has a whole army so so the shadows basically the shadow officers go ahead and kind of do their one-on-ones with the, the other monarchs but it doesn't really work out because Carisha is uh, the queen of insects. So she goes and tries to dominate Biru to his will. But what she didn't notice is that the beast monarch 
was already finished at the time, the Frost Monarch was dying, because uh, Sung Jin Woo came up and destroyed them, like, you know, typical protagonist. And then, she, and then so with her fight with Sung Jin Woo, she was trying to um, dominate Biru, and he basically, Sung Jin Woo came in, and he was like, yo, what is going on? That's my soldier? So he basically just cut her in half. As we know, that she, all, all the monarchs have crazy regeneration, kind of like Piccolo regeneration, so she just regenerated her body and tried to use Venom on Sung Jin Woo, but as we know from the manhwa, Sung Jin Woo has poison resistance because why not? <laughs> He's an overpowered protagonist, he has poison resistance, so it doesn't work on him. So he basically just the fight ensues, but then she turns into her spirit, spiritual manifestation, which is basically like a insect humanoid kind of looking thing. And I'll leave a picture up so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But she basically turns into like an insect insect humanoid. But then she goes on and tries to kill Sun Jung Woo again, but he easily dodges using Ruler's authority, which is basically like the force. He's using the force to basically like, you know, use put gravity on her and he dodges and then he basically just cuts her into like a thousand tiny little pieces so that she can't regenerate and use the regeneration ability. So some of the abilities that she had, she had immense strength because she was actually able to go one-on-one -on -one with uh, Sung Jin Woo. She was able to punch him and actually draw some blood from him. And she was actually able to basically manhandle Biru, which is Biru is one of the strongest shadow officers in Sung Jin Woo's army. And she was manhandling him and it was, it was basically nothing to her. But then she also had mana manipulation, which is she had kind of like these, she can make hands or green hands out of her mana. And this was kind of like the ability of Gara. If you watch Naruto, Gara had kind of like these sand hands that would come out of the sky. She kind of has like that type of magic or mana manipulation that she can make giant green hands that can, you know, grab you or chase after her opponents. And then she also had uh, her spiritual body manifestation, which we know is a insect-like humanoid, which can you know secrete very vicious toxins that will can really mess up somebody if they weren't resistant to toxins, like we saw with Sung Jin Woo. But then she also had necromancy as well because she's the queen of insects so she could use parasites to raise the dead, which is very creepy when you think about it. You just put a parasite into this, uh, a dead person's body and it, it's able to. And then she also had regeneration, like we, are, we already knew that all the monarchs basically have crazy regeneration, um, but it was circumvented by Sung Jiru because he cut her to a thousand pieces, so you couldn't really regenerate your body when, <laughs> when your body isn't like so many tiny little pieces. But that's basically it. That's Karisha, the queen of insects. If you guys have any more uh, things that you know about her that I didn't recover in this video, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. Welcome back guys, and today we're going to be explaining the fro Monarch of Frost further than the Monwood did. I personally think he was the coolest monarch just because of how evil he was and how he was able to push Sung Jin Woo to the next level of power that he, the personality of the Frost Monarch is that he was a cocky person and he was shy to get ahead of plans. So he was a very calculated and cold conniving person. And he also did not like to get into any unnecessary fights. As you can see in the chapters that he was, while he was trying to track down the shadow monarch, he just put the humans to sleep instead of actually fighting them which is uncanny for a monarch because the other monarchs would try to toy with them and just basically destroy them or kill them or basically eat them. But the Frost Monarch wasn't really like that. He was a more of a civilized monarch. If you're getting into the story, it's the first time we saw him is when he was in the cave with the Beast Monarch. They first ran into each other and they were talking about how they think that the Shadow Monarch was on Earth. But then after that, he went ahead and he went ahead to America to basically kill all the ruler's vessels that were on Earth. Um, so when he achieved doing that, but then he was trying to go back to Korea because there was one more ruler vessel that was on Earth. But then all of a sudden he ran into Il Juan. And Il Juan, if you guys don't know, or if you guys don't haven't read Subtle Leveling, is basically uh, Sung Jin Woo, the main character's father. And Il Juan is a, a ruler vessel himself, and he went ahead and tried to um, kill the Iron Body Monarch and the Frost Monarch while he, they were trying to leave America. But it didn't really work out because he wasn't as strong as, as strong as so he kind of had to run away. Then uh, the Frost Monarch goes ahead and even though he was interrupted, he goes ahead to 
uh, Korea or Seoul just to go ahead and kill the ruler ruler vessel in Seoul. And the ruler vessel in Seoul, in Seoul was uh, Go Gun Hee. Uh, I'm probably pronouncing these things wrong, but Go Gun Hee, which was the the chairman of the Hunters Association in Korea, and he was kind of like a father figure to Sun Jin Woo because. Sung Ji Woo's father was, he was gone. That man, <laughs> that man has been gone for ages. But he was kind of like a father figure to Sung Ji Woo. And so we kind of find out that the Frost Monarch has, you know, just, they, they get into a fight and the Frost Monarch just completely destroys Go Gun Hee. Like he's completely outmatched. And then um, the shadow that's on Go Gun Hee recognizes that, you know, he's about to die. So. Um, it alerts Sung Jun Woo, and then Sung Jun Woo just teleports. He uses his spiritual, his uh, shadow transportation, and he was able to teleport into the office as soon as he saw that Go Gun He was like pierced by the Frost Monarch. And then we saw that uh, that Sung Jun Woo got really mad, and he was about to destroy the Frost Monarch, but the Frost Monarch was able to escape because he threw a spear at Go Gun He while he was about to die, which forced. Sung Jin Woo to help him out um, instead of actually chasing after the Frost Monarch. Since, since the Frost Monarch was able to escape, he then went ahead and tried to recruit more Monarchs to the cause of actually killing the Sora, Shadow Monarch. Because the Shadow Monarch would probably get in the way of, uh, of the ruler of the Monarchs in the Ruler War. So he wanted to go ahead and... But all the other Monarchs were like, nah, I don't think that's the right choice because they all know that the Shadow Monarch is about business. They're not just going to run up and kill him they have to actually plan it out. But the only people that agreed with going ahead and killing the Frost Monarch was the, the Queen of Insects, the Plague Monarch, and the King of Beasts, the, the, the uh, Beast Monarch, as, I, as I've already discovered or I've already covered in previous episodes. Um, so they all went to Seoul and uh, the, the Beast Monarch was kind of like a distraction and they just went to Seoul and the Beast Monarch just started ravaging and started picking fights with all the hunters there, basically killing them all and just destroying them uh, because nobody can really face up to the power of the Monarchs. Um, so then Sung Jin Woo gets involved and he has to, you know, fight the Beast Monarch, the, the, the Plague Monarch, the Frost Monarch all at the same time. And he does this pretty well with his shadow soldiers. Um, he was able to kill Karisha, but uh, after, when he was distracted with the plague, finishing off the plague monarch, the beast monarch was able to impale him, and then the frost monarch went and uh, impaled him as well. So the frost monarch was thinking that, hey, we just killed this, we just impaled him, and we just impaled him through the heart. This guy's dead, right? But then they didn't know that um, apparently the the shadow monarch has like a shadow heart, so he has like two hearts. So, so apparently, he, they awaken um, the Shadow Monarch's memories, and Sung Jin Woo was able to go ahead and see the first Shadow Monarch, and it was able to awaken his powers. The rest is history from there. The Beast Monarch runs away because he doesn't want the smoke, so the Frost Monarch st stands his ground and tries to actually uh, fight the Sung Jin Woo's awakening. Um, but it, he's too, Sung Jin Woo is just too powerful. He's the, the main character, and he just wipes the Frost Monarch off of the face of the earth. So some of the abilities that the Frost Monarch had was that he had immense strength like all the other monarchs. He was able to just basically mass secure Go Gun He in his office with like no sweat. And then he was able to force Sung Jin Woo to his limits because he basically killed him the first time. And then he also had immense speed. He was able to pressure Sung Jin Woo and he completely evaded all of Go Gun He's uh, attacks. So he was really high up there on speed. And then he also had ice magic. He was able to create weapons from ice magic. And he was able to create uh, a bunch of ice giants and soldiers from the ice. And he was able to summon like huge ice storms. And he was able to like put up huge walls of ice and kind of use huge waves of ice. He, he, he kind of was like Todoroki in a sense. And then he also had a spiritual body manifestation. Um, the manhwa doesn't really touch on the spiritual body manifestation. They just kind of show what the the manifest the transformation looks like. And he kind of just, you know, he kind of just grew really long white hair with uh, his, his elf ears sticking out. And that was really about it. Uh, I guess that he got a power, a power boost from this because, you know, the, the manhwa's are very vague in spiritual body manifestation power-ups, like how powerful did they get? Um, but he looked pretty cool while he was doing it. 
And then his last skill was sleep inducement. And he had a skill that just allowed him to snap his fingers and the people around him would just fall to sleep. And I guess that has to do with like the long winter or something or like hibernation that he's the frost monarch so he would have the power to put people to sleep. So yeah, so that's basically it. That's the Frost Monarch in a nutshell. That's everything that we know about the Frost Monarch. If you guys know more information, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. In today's video, we're going to be explaining Baron, the Demon King, the Monarch of White Flames, in further detail. So the personality of the Demon King is he was a really uh, brave warrior that really never backed down from a fight. And you can see this during his Sung Jun Woo fight that he, even though um, Sung Jun Woo started to get the better of him, he didn't really care. He was just gonna go at it with his all with his full potential. So basically, the history of Baron is that he took part in the Rulers' War that happened, you know, maybe about a hundred years ago, um, when the the monarchs all teamed up together just to kill kill the the absolute ruler of the rulers, and they succeeded in doing so. But then they went ahead and uh, tried to kill Ashborn. So Antares, basically the leader of the monarchs, was like, hey, we need to kill Ashborn. He's kind of a threat. Um, and he told the beast monarch and Balron, the demon king, to do so. But it didn't work out for them, <laughs> as we can see, um, because Balron died and the beast king was mortally wounded and he, he fled the battlefield. So that's why, that's basically all we know about his history. So what happens in the actual uh, story with him and Sung Jun Woo is that the architect, the person that created the system for Sung Jun Woo was able to create an after image of him and put him in the Hell Dungeon. The Hell Dungeon was probably one of the coolest dungeons that we've seen in solo leveling. And I think that's probably one of the best. And you know, at the time he was, he was placed as the king of the, that, or the final boss of that dungeon. So then when Sung Jun Woo went ahead and fought him, it's believed that he wasn't really at his full potential because that was like an after image or a image created by the architect and it wasn't actually the Demon King. Even though the, even, even though he wasn't as uh, powerful as a monarch, uh, Sung Jun Woo still really struggled with him because he was still like an s rank hunter. He wasn't like a national rank hunter at the time. So it was still a hard fought fight. It's probably one of the best fights in solo leveling. So I suggest that you guys read it. And it had the most loot at the end that had crazy potential for him to use it in the rest of the series, even though we don't really see him use the, his items that much in the series afterwards. But I think that it was a really good stepping point for Sung Jun Woo to go into that national rank hunter level. So some of the skills that Baron and the Demon King had is that he had immense strength. He was able to push Sung Jun Woo to his limit in this fight. Even though he wasn't like a national rank hunter at this time, he was still able to push Baron to his full, or he was still able to push Sung Jun Woo to his full potential. And he was a, he was a monarch, so every monarch has a army and he could summon a a crazy amount of demons through his portals, which was kind of crazy. If you saw the panel, the first time I saw somebody summon that amount of people was crazy. And the way that Sang Jin Woo just sliced all of them up was actually, was absolutely fantastic. That was probably the one of the best fights that I've seen in uh, solo leveling and what can encourage me to keep on reading the manhwa. And then he could also summon lightning breath. This guy could freaking breathe lightning and it would, it was like a, uh, a lightning attack that he could breathe through his fucking mouth and he would be able to just shoot it like lightning beams at uh, Sung Jun Woo through his mouth. And then as all the monarchs had, they had spiritual mon body manifestation. Even though we really didn't see it, maybe he couldn't, maybe the architect couldn't copy his spiritual body manifestation just because he isn't a monarch anymore. Um, he's just like a reincarnation of, uh, you know, he's just, he's just an image or a clone of the of the monarch of White Flame. So we, we never really got to see it, but I, I oppose that he would get a Senkai boost or you'd get a big power up, just like the, all, the, all the other monarchs get when they get uh, into spiritual body manifestation. But yeah, we don't really get to see it. Um, I think that Baron, the Monarch of White Flames, is an interesting character. We don't really get to see his full power, so just have it, take it with a grain of salt that he probably is stronger than basically the copy that he fought with Sinjin Wu, but he might, he, he, he's probably on the strength of the Monarch level, just that we didn't get to see that in the Monarch because he was already dead, okay? Um, so let me know in the comments below if you guys liked it, and if you guys know any more about Baron, the demon, this is everything you need to know about the Iron Body Monarch. He is probably one of the most forgettable monarchs in all of solo leveling. 
I forgot that he even existed, but let's get into it. The Iron Body Monarch, his personality was he was a very egotistical and cocky type of person, and he had a, a huge disdain towards humans, which was proven when he, when he didn't like Sun Jin Wu being the Shadow Monarch, and he just went ahead and just completely disregarded him as the Shadow Monarch just because he was a human. The history, everything we know about him, he was basically one of the ones that went to Christopher Reed, the, one of the strongest ruler from manifestations on earth and he went ahead and killed them with the help of the, the insect monarch and the beast monarch. But ever since then, he, he knew that Sung Jin Woo was the Shadow monarch, but he knew that he was a little bit too powerful for him to take him on with like, like the beast monarch, the insect monarch, and the frost monarch did. So he at least waited till Antares, the monarch of destruction, was around to be able to launch an attack on earth. Even though with the help of Antares, the Monarch of Destruction, it didn't really work out well for him because while the Antares and the, the Monarch of Transfiguration were occupied with other fighters, he was basically outmatched with uh, Thomas Andre. And Thomas Andre is another ruler of manifestation. Even though Thomas Andre isn't on the strength as monarchs are, just because he's a like a reincarnation of a ruler. The only thing that helped him defeat uh, the, the mon Iron Body Monarch is that Belion and Biru, basically the officers of the, the Sh Shadow Monarch's army, were there to help him basically dispatch of him. He wasn't really a much of a threat after that, the Iron Body Monarch. He basically got wiped off the planet with no real fight. So just like all the other monarchs, he had certain skills, he had superhuman strength, he had superhuman durability and he had spiritual body manifestation. The only like unique skill to him was that he was able to have, he, he was able to use telepathy, which not a lot of the other monarchs could use. I think only the destruction and the transfigure monarch could do, um, but that was basically it. He didn't really have any special skills. He, he really didn't have much to do with the story. He was just there on the, when Antares planned his attack on earth and he just got wiped. Like, he was really a useless character, and he was just there to have more monarchs to help and Antares. But yeah, that's basically it. If you guys have any questions, or want to know, or if you have more information on the Iron Body Monarch, leave it in the comments. Explaining everything we need to know about the Monarch of Transfiguration, also known as Yogamut. Yogamut is a lackey for Antares, and just like the Iron Body Monarch, he was kind of useless. He didn't really do anything because Sung Jun Wu was that powerful that he kind of just rendered all the other monarchs useless, except for Antares. But let's get into it. So the personality of Yoga Munt is that he was a speciest, or I don't know if that's the actual word, but he infused humans as inferior beings to basically whatever the monarchs are. I don't know what the race of the monarchs are, they never really went over that. Basically what Yoga Munt, the Monarch of Transfiguration, did in the story, um, the first time we see him is when he went ahead and interacted with the Frost Monarch during the like Monarch meeting, where they were like, yo, the Shadow Monarch is up to something, we need to do something about it. But he was one of the ones that stayed behind and wanted to wait for Antares' support because they know um, from the past, you know, the ruler war, that going up, going up against the Shadow Monarch without Antares is kind of foolish. So he was the one that waited instead. So the Frost Monarch, um, even though he, he went ahead and tried to figure out if the Frost Monarch would wait as well, so he went ahead and had a secret meeting with him. But Il Huan, the father of Sung Jun Wu, was actually there. And so he was trying to assassinate them, but it didn't work out because two monarchs against the ruler is basically, it's basically over. <laughs> There's no real uh, debate about it. So after that, we saw him in when the Antares actually invaded the Earth, and that's when you actually saw Yogamunt actually do something for the first time in his life. He actually transported all of the all of the dragons, the dragon army or whatever, to the Earth, and then that's kind of all he did because Sung Jun Wu basically rendered him useless because he used Dragon Sphere. Uh, dragon Sphere was a skill that he picked up in like a dungeon or something where he, it basically renders everybody that's weaker than you um, frozen in fear so <clears throat> that's really all he did in the war there was nothing that the only thing he did was transport an army that couldn't do anything so useless like nothing nothing about them was useful uh, just like the iron body monarch they were there for like a couple panels and then 
uh, Sung Jin Woo just basically made them useless. Uh, the skills that he had, just like all the other monarchs, he probably had superhuman strength, he probably had spiritual body manifestation, and he probably had um, superhuman speed, but we never get to see anything because the, the main character is just too OP. Leave a comment in the comment section if you guys know a little bit more, or if you guys have could three theory craft of what else he could have been able to do. Um, I think that he was one of the monarchs that was able to make the, the, the telepathy between Antares and the Iron Body Monarch. Like, he, I think he was the one that created that link so they could talk freely in their minds. But um, it doesn't really say in the manhwa and it's not really specific about it. So let me know what you guys think about in the comments. I was explaining Ashborn, the former monarch of shadows, the king of dead, and one of the most powerful rulers in the history of solo leveling. All right, now let's get into it. So the personality of Ashborn is that he was a very demeaning, he had a very demeaning attitude towards, attitude towards uh, humanity. Um, he, he was also a really loyal person to the absolute being, which was the king of the, of the rulers. And he also wanted the peace between rulers and monarchs. So basically the history of Ashborn is that he first started off as a ruler um, you guys might not know this, but he was a, one of the most powerful rulers in solo leveling history. And what happened was, how, like, so you're probably wondering, how the hell did he turn into the Shadow Monarch? So what had happened was, is that he, he, he was fighting in the, basically, the ruler in Monarch War, the Hundred Year War that's been going on forever and ever. And what happened was, is that the rulers uh, basically turned against the Absolute Being because they found out that the absolute being was kind of just using this war as entertainment for himself. So they turned on him and Ashborn was literally the only ruler that stayed loyal to the absolute being. And doing this, the rulers and the martyr killed Ashborn. So he was basically outnumbered 100 to 1. And then the absolute being followed suit. So that after the absolute being died, um, Ashborn kind of felt a power inside of the absolute monarch and he kind of used that power to transform himself into the Shadow Monarch. He noticed that there was a, bar a power, power difference between um, the monarchs and the rulers because they had the rulers had captured Legia, the King of Giants. So without the Legia, the monarchs kind of had a they had they were missing a person. So he he, he filled this gap between the monarch's power with his absolute you know power because he was the one of the powerful most powerful rulers so now he that he's a shadow monarch he went ahead and fought with the monarchs even though he was you know a, a loyal ruler to the absolute being he was all up with the monarchs and then they kind of noticed baron and the demon king and the beast monarch kind of noticed that like hey this guy is this guy is really powerful and it, so everybody started to fear him they noticed that uh, even the rulers as well, they started to fear that Ashborn was a really powerful monarch and that he should be taken out. So this is what led to the Demon King dying <laughs> because the Demon King and the Beast King tried to go ahead and kill Ashborn off for themselves because they realized that he was he was a really very powerful monarch. And w what do you think happened? They got wiped off the face of the earth. The Beast King ran away and Demon King died. So that's why that's why Sun Jin Wu was fighting a illusion of the Demon King. So after this after this assault uh, of the Beast King and the Demon King, the Shadow Monarch basically lost most of his army during this. So he he wanted to seek his revenge and he basically hid away from the, the monarchs in the ruler war. So while this happened, the, the power balance went into the favor of the rulers again. So the monarchs were forced into hiding. So now that the Shadow Monarch was in hiding and the rulers were forced into hiding, um, they started to prepare themselves for the attack on Earth again. And this is when Ashborn found Sung Jin Woo. He was looking for somebody to be his vessel and could be able to harness his powers just like uh, the rulers did on Earth as well. So they could you know, set the ground up for their assault on Earth. Um, however, Ashborn was the only one was like, uh, I'm not gonna, you like, take over his body i'm just gonna let him use my powers and to do what he sees fit but he did get to a point where he didn't know all of his full powers and that's where the beast frost king uh, the beast king the frost king and the queen of insects uh were able to kill him uh, momentarily and that's when he had a actual vision of the ashborn talking to him and trying to give him his options so basically ashborn said hey 
you know, this is going to be a hard fight. You're probably not going to win it. So if you just want to go ahead and live in like a Genjutsu, live in a Genjutsu and just live in your fantasy world, uh, I can do that with my powers. Or I can reincarnate you and you can have the full powers of the Shadow Monarch, but you're going to have to fight an uphill battle. And of course, Sung Jin Ryu is the main character of the, of the manhwa, so what do you think he did? He went ahead and took the, the ladder and he said, I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna fucking destroy everybody. And that's basically what he did. So abilities, uh, the Shadow Monarch was probably one of the most powerful monarchs, except for Antares. He didn't match up with Antares in raw strength, but he had some of the coolest abilities in the manhwa. So some of the abilities he had, he had superhuman strength, like everybody else. He was probably the second the second in line for the strength of you know the monarchs and then the the second ability that he had that he was basically invulnerable to um physical trauma because he was like a shadow he you couldn't really touch him or be able to do inflict damage on him because he was like a shadow you couldn't really and then he also had power bestowal like as he's as we said in the in the history part of it that he was able to store store his powers into a vessel to basically use them for reincarnation um, even though he didn't choose to do that, he just let Sung Jin Mu use his powers for whatever he wanted to do. Um, but like uh, the rulers, they were using, they were storing power into humans so they could reincarnate into their bodies. They also had rulers' authority, or, like we've seen Sung Jin Ryu use in the in his uh, in the past when he unlocked the skill. It's basically where you can move uh, objects around tele telekinetically, uh, just like he was, you know, using using it, he was using religious authority to basically pick up people out of the air and just throw them around. Then he also had sh shadow extraction, like we see Sung Jin Ryu use in the, in the, in the manhwa. This is basically a, a skill that allows a person to um, ra rise a shadow out of a, a, out of a dead player or a dead um, NPC and use it as their own army. And then he also had shadow exchange, where he was able to use his shadows to basically teleport wherever his shadows were stationed at and he basically had a free travel every three hours and then he also had shadow preservation where he was able to store the shadows and basically use them or pop them out whenever he wanted to the monarch's domain which was he was able to buff the strength of all of his shadows by 50 percent in a battle so that's basically it. That's all of the things that we know about Ash Barn right now. If you guys liked it, go ahead and give it a like. And if you guys have any more information that I did not see or uh, talk about in this video, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and I'll be sure to get back to you. Destroy everything for that is the sole mission of our existence, which was said by Antares, the strongest monarch in solo leveling. Antares is the king of dragons and the destruction monarch. He was probably the one of the strongest in solo leveling had a very huge disdain towards human he killed millions and millions of people in canada and really didn't give a fuck about it and he had some sense of cruel honor where he was offering a side to sung jun woo because he knew that sung jun woo was a really strong monarch so he wanted to give a side on his team the history of antares we saw him in the ruler war like all the other monarchs and he was the one that put the order to go ahead and execute ashborn because they everybody saw that ashborn was a really strong monarch and he didn't really like that so he he wanted the baron the demon king and the beast monarch to go ahead and kill ashborn but we all know how that ended up they both got brutally murdered and didn't achieve anything in the meantime so once the rulers uh, won the war, uh, the monarchs went into hiding and Antares did the same thing. Antares, it took a lot longer for him to come back to Earth just because he was one of the most powerful monarchs. So it was harder for him to find a vessel. He later found out that through yoga months that Sung Jin Ryu was the shadow monarch or the shadow monarch vessel. And he noticed that he, they, he wasn't on the monarch side. So he was not very happy about this and started to muster his armies to launch a raid on Earth for to just to enter, just in order to draw Sung Jun Woo out. So when this happened, he he first appeared in Canada and he killed millions and millions of people in Canada with his army of dragons. He basically wiped Canada off the map and that forced Sung Jun Woo to come out of hiding and to go ahead and fight him. So the, what happened is that Sung Jun Woo basically teleported uh, him and Antares to a 
a remote island because he knew their battle was going to destroy a lot of the place places or a lot of the battlefield so he kind of just teleported them out of there and they they got it cracking it, even though Sung Jin Woo couldn't really place a scratch on him because Antares was the strongest monarch and he was really outmatched in strength Sung Jin Woo went ahead and got the strategy that even though I can't really uh I can't really put a scratch onto him. Our attacks are so strong and powerful that it's creating a rift in Earth. So that rift allowed the rulers, all the rulers, all the rulers' minions, all the rulers to come out of the sky and basically put an end to Antares because he couldn't handle all of them at once. So some of the powers that Antares had. He had superhuman strength, as I was saying throughout the video. He was probably the most, he was the strongest monarch no, no one even came close. Only Ashborn, but it wasn't even like a fragment of his power. And he was also invulnerable. Antares was almost near invincible. Nobody could put any physical trauma to him just because of his dragon scales. And then he also had Dragon's Fear, the skill that Sung Jin Woo had that rendered anybody weaker than him. Uh, frozen in Fear, Flame, Flame Breath, that basically negated all of Sung Jin Woo's attacks and could incinerate uh, S-rank hunters in the blink of an eye. And then the last one is that he was able to telepathically communicate to all of the monarchs in the in Earth. That's basically it for Antares. Antares was the king of dragons and the destruction of the monarch. Let me know in the comments below if you guys have any more information or do you think that Antares isn't the strongest monarch? Let me know in the comments. I want to see what you... Today we're going to be talking about Sung Jin Woo, the original king of Flex. It is probably one of the best glow ups in manga history. I'm going to protect my family even if it means turning all the world, world's hunters in the world against me. That's something that Sung Jin Woo said when he was talking to Li Zhuang, the, the top uh, hunter in China. So the personality of Sung Jin Woo is that he was a very humble hunter because he, you know, he really couldn't protect anybody or do anything. But when he started to uh, increase his level, increase his power level, he would be humble even though he was probably one of the most powerful hunters in Asia at the time. So the history of Sung Jin Woo, I'm not going to get into specifics because it's basically going to spoil the whole premise of soul leveling. But he he was the he was the only like person I saw in Mama that go to get went through a crazy Giga Chat transformation. This guy went to, you know, let me get a hug to don't hug me. <laughs> this guy went to there was a, he was the worst worst hunter in the world and he couldn't even protect anybody and a lot of people got killed because of him. But then after that he was he went ahead and leveled up through the system that the architect gave him and throughout that system it really trained him to become a man and somebody that people could depend on he was the only one that could actually solo level he was the only hunter that was able to go ahead into a dungeon and solo clear it by himself because of the powers that the architect gave him which were the shadow monarch's powers and so he was the only one that was able to go into a dungeon and just completely clear it in like five minutes because he had his army and he, all, he was also probably one of the strongest hunters at the time. Raised to the rank of S rank hunter in like only a couple of months, which was never heard before. You can't, in the world of solo leveling, you, you could barely even, uh, you can't even change your rank. And so it was, it was a shock to people in the world that this guy came from E rank hunter all the way from the bottom to the top. And he also went through a, a body transformation. He went from a scrawny little kid to a guy that like looking like David Lade. He transformed like this is because the system basically gave him workouts and plans for him to become a lot more stronger. And in those workouts, he he basically had to do a set amount of workouts every day. I think it was like a kilometer run, like a thousand push-ups, a thousand sit-ups, like kind of like the One Punch Man training reg regimen. But the, the only difference was is that if he didn't complete that amount of push-ups, sit-ups, or a kilometer run, then he would have to go to a danger zone. It's basically like dragons and basic huge scorpions trying to kill him. So if he didn't complete a workout, he would basically be in, his life was in danger. So the powers of Sung Jin Woo, he had superhuman strength because in the Manwa, he basically destroyed almost all of his opponents without really a, a basically destroyed the Cha and then Thomas Andre, the ruler, he destroyed him. And then he also destroyed the beast monarch in like four hits. So 
I, it really shows how strong that guy was by the end of the end of the manga and he was invulnerable he was immune to poisons diseases he's basically the manifestation of death so it wouldn't make sense if death could die to poisons debuffs and diseases and he was also immune to physical trauma because you can't really hurt the shadow he also had a crazy regenerative healing factor due to the system which every time he slept he would able he would be able to heal it any wound that he incurred in the, the previous battle. He also had boosted, he was broken in his XP level. This guy was, he was boosted in his level. He was boosting crazy. He was able to become the strongest hunter in Asia in only a couple months, which was never had, which was never done before and nobody could ever like change ranks. So that's probably one of the most amazing feats in, uh, that Sung Jin Woo did in solo leveling. And he also had ruler's authority. Like I've talked in previous videos, he was able to take control of an object and kind of just move it around. He did it to a couple of enemies. He did it to Beerus in this fight with the, the Ant King. He was also able to raise uh, enemies that he had killed before, just like he did to Igris, just like he did to Beerus. All of the strong minions that he's killed before, he was able to recruit to his own army by shadow extraction. He also had shadow preservation where he could like just basically put all the army into his shadow. And then he also had shadow exchange where he was able to teleport with any shadow that he had stationed throughout the world and then he also had monarch's domain which basically buffs all of his shadows by 50 percent that's basically it for sung jin woo sung jin woo is probably one of the the most craziest transformation that we've seen in mana manwa and he's just the flex god like anything you guys have to read the you guys have to read the manwa i can't really explain it or i'm just going to spoil the whole thing that's it that's all i got to say about you know the second monarch uh the second shadow monarch Chung Jin Woo. If you guys agree, go ahead and leave a comment in the in the on the video and give it a like and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Go.